Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first Backstage of 2022. This is the fourth season of our events. We discovered many uh, secrets and the behind the scenes details. And today we want to tell you one story, actually a couple of stories, in front of the main protagonist inside of the museum. Today we are here only virtually, but we can discover a few details even without people here present. So we tell the story of a, a car, the Grand Premio Tipo A, debuting in 1931, but it had two lives. At least for the Museum of Alfa Romeo, its history goes till the beginning of the 80s, but let's make a step backwards to 18th of May 1931, when for the first time this car was seen on the street. Attilio Marinoni was the head of test drivers, historical test pilot of Alfa Romeo, at 8.30 goes out of the Portello Gate in Corso Traiano, uh, goes on Viale Jenner, Viale Monza, and uh, this is a Grand Prix car, today it will be a Formula One, it goes in front of the Villa Real of Monza, um, and then uh, he arrives at the circuit, and there the history starts, the history of uh, an impossible single-seater because it has two engines and a very specific disposition and setting, but it will have a very important role and not so extravagant as we could imagine today. Everything was born when a new director general was appointed, Prospero Gianferrari. It was a political appointment. He had to take on several roles, having to do with automobiles and airplanes. He was the founder of Ali, the first Italian airline company. But when he arrived at Alfa Romeo, he decided that the company, and you should not forget that it was called the best automobile producer in the world, at least from the regime period, it was chosen to interpret a role, a competitive one, a brilliant role, an international one. Prospero Gianferrari acts on different aspects to try and transform the company. And one of the main nuts was the races. In 1930, Alfa just won for the second time, actually for the third time, the Mille Miglia, uh, breaking a record for the first time, 100 kilometers per hour as an average. But there was a, a tighter nut, which was the Grand Prix. The years of the P2, which dominated the first world championship are over, the rules uh, changed, the P2 was out and Alfa Romeo focused on sports cars. In 1931, though, the Federation of Automobile Clubs issues the new norms of the Free Formula European Championship, which had very few limitations from a technical point of view, but had another limitation. So Grand Prix had to last 10 hours each for one pilot only. So it was real single-seaters and not two-seaters. Vittorio Iano was immediately called by Prospero Gianferrari. They wanted a car that could compete in that new championship, that new universe. Vittorio Iano was coming from a success of 1,500 and 1,350 and just debuted the 853, which would have a great future at the uh, uh, Mille Miglia, Targa Florio, uh, 24 Hours of Le Mans, and also Grand Prix. But in order to run the uh, free circuits, Grand Prix, the 8th C2003 was uh, registered with a 180-190 km per hour maximum speed at the time, Iano, thought that in order to be competitive in the new free formula, they had at least, uh, they needed at least 210, 215 kilometers per hour of max kilometers. So there were no time, there was no budget to develop a car from scratch. And while Iano starts to sketch a new body of a car that would evolve over the years, well, the engine was a problem which was hard to solve. So 
They decided with a pragmatic, practical solution, but in the style of uh, John Ferrari, to put two cars in the same, uh, two engines in the same car. It was nothing new. Maserati and other builders uh, had two engines cars, but Yano decided a very peculiar technical solution. He imagined to use two engines of the 6C 1500 Grand Sport, which just won the legendary Mille Miglia with Nuvolari, uh, racing at more than 100 kilometers per hour, and uh, to install them one next to the other. The two engines are the first problem, and then there was the problem of the transmission. Yano thinks of saving even more, not only using these uh, engines, but also the uh, switch boxes, the gear boxes, the same of the 1750, and building a dedicated back bridge. But what today could appear a second choice, so you take uh, two engines and you couple them, actually was a much more complex solution and the modifications go beyond the simple use of two engines. As it will be briefly explained by Vittorio Iano and the press, but even more by Luigi Fusi, who in the 60s starts to complain the lack of this car in the museum. So for uh, a type A were built at the time, but no one was left. Luigi Fusi explains that the parts of the four type A were taken uh, for uh, and used uh, on other race cars because the uh, engines and the gearboxes were slightly modified for this car whose ambition was to compete and win in the upper part of the ranking. So in the famous Battles of Giants, so the highest uh, power cars. But today the car in the museum shows the main part, the two engines of the car, but let's discover the peculiarities and the characteristics which made it something more than the simple union of two cars. First of all, the two engines were not those produced in line. Vittorio Iano changed them for a, a Grand Prix, which was even more challenging than the Mille Miglia because it lasted 10 hours, so Vittorio Iano in both cases changes the supports going from 5 to 8 mm, to make the shaft less uh, heavy. And so he wanted to make everything lighter. So he started to use aluminum instead of cast iron, anticipating the 6C and a uh, as done with another car and replacing all the parts uh, in aluminum with electron, limiting the total weight uh, to 900 kilograms, which were a little bit more than the reference, which was 750, 800 kilograms. But with 220 horsepower, the car had an exuberant torque. The other activity has to do with the change of the rotation of the engine. So uh, Vittorio Iano realizes that coupling two engines is the first stage and then they had to overturn them in order to have the exhaust tubes outside and not one of them inside. So if the left engine maintains its original setting for the right engine, for example, the uh, exhaust uh, uh, tubes were redone as the compressors in a symmetrical way, in order to have them on the opposite side. Also, the rotation direction is inverted and if we go to the back, the two frictions are the normal frictions of 16,750 or certain versions and the gearbox, even though the box is the original one, even though it's lighter, 
have three gears and different brakes. So the real challenge by Jan was to couple the driving wheel. It was impossible uh, also to have two shift sticks. So Jan devised a coupling system based on a spherical joint allowing to a single lever to operate the two gears. It looks like impossible. These were not synchronized gears, but not a single pilot in those races ever complained about changing gears. Of course, all the tools were a double, two manometers, two rev counters and one manometer of a pressure of fuel because there was a back tank which was operated by hand through this pump to push the fuel towards the carburetor. So other parts are uh, similar to the 1750, but the first question mark was differential or non-differential. And the first version of the type A, Vittorio Iano, uh, doesn't include a differential. He thought that having two engines, this could be enough to compensate and offset the turning of the wheels in the curve, but several solutions were experimented. A differential was also a month, but the pylons didn't show any improve. In the end, the final solution was to mount it to free wheels, just like those of the bicycles that allowed to absorb small differences. And then, when it was assembled, this car was used uh, for a test in the uh, streets of the Portello Luigi Bazzi, one of the historical mechanics of the Ferrari and would follow Enzo Ferrari in his adventure at Maralello, would do the carburation. Luigi Bazzi underlined how important, well, fundamental, would be having the right engine uh, operating the right wheel and the left engine operating the left uh, wheel having a perfect carburation. The two engines had to have the same minimum at the same settings in order not to create difficulties in the drive. And Luigi Bazzi did the final testing of the car, which was uh, described as a powerful, a brilliant accelerating car, but also uh, very easy to use in mixed, on mixed terrain, even though it was, uh, it was born for fast circuits and the press was waiting very curiously for the presentation of this car because Alfa Romeo at the time was represented as a brand having great sports car, great uh, cars for uh, uh, winding circuits, but that still had not cars to compete among the big ones, the 12 cylinders as it was called, forget it, that it was made up of two units of six cylinders, was the car which completed so the range of the Alfa Romeo cars and then something on the body of the car. This technical setting and the uh, new frame with uh, parts derived from the 16,750 uh, Gran Turismo with the compressor, so the last one. And the HC2003 was very narrow, allowing to have a very slender body, which in the front part was very similar to an 8C2003 Monza, even though behind the grid the two radiators were separated, one for each engine, and along the car it maintained a certain slenderness, not showing two complete mechanics under the skin of the car, one characteristic of the body of the car, uh, which is not visible here at the museum because uh, this car uh, shows the internal part to the audience was the fact that for the first time there were no openings here at the pilot seat to make easier entering the exit of the car. But there was sort of a circular shape. It was an innovation. The pilots didn't like it because they felt trapped there in the case of accident would have had difficulty leaving the car. As we know, the car uh, does a, a circuit test at the Portello, then with uh, Marinoni, goes in the street and goes to Monza. At the circuit, they start 
to drive the car, the different pilots, and everyone described the incredible performances, the power, uh, the drivability, the acceleration. Everyone was very curious. The main pilots were Nuvolari, Campari, everyone tried it. And for the entire morning they have these results. And the cars were not even painted yet. And after the lunch break, a young pilot, Luigi Arcangeli, goes to Gianferrari and Miano and asks them, can I try this car as well? Everyone is talking about it with enthusiasm. Luigi Arcangeli starts at the first lap. He takes off the hands from the wheel, waving at his colleagues. But at the second lap, he doesn't come back. He doesn't come back. They think that one of the two engines has a problem. After that, the responsible of the circuit calls uh, Alfa Romeo, saying that uh, it went off-road uh, at the Ascari curb, where also Uvo Gossivocci with the P1 lost his life a few years before. Rugar Cangeli, when Gianferrari and Jano arrive, there already uh, was found dead, and the car was too broken to be used again. So they think to bring it to the Portello, but it is so damaged that they could not even put it on the truck. So it was housed in the old hangars of Monza. So at the time, the next day, at the day of the race, they decide to leave the debut of this car to another competition. But there's a signal of the changing of times. In Montellerie in 1925, when Antonio Ascari died on the racetrack, Vittorio Iano said, and Nicola Romeo said, we don't race with the casualty, and the entire team uh, was withdrawn for the races. In the evening, when they were organizing uh, the next day race, a letter arrived from Rome, a telegram saying, you have to race and win without considering that one of the young pilots died. So the mechanics of Alfa Romeo go back uh, to the Portello and quickly they start to try to complete the second part of the, uh, the second uh, exemplary of type A, which was left in Milan the next morning at 7 a.m. Uh, it goes to Monza, it was not painted, they painted it uh, on the place and it was given to Tazio Nuvolari. Tazio Nuvolari was young, exuberant and he had the driving capacity uh, for the power of this car. So the race starts while other pilots uh, were racing and Nuvolari starts to set very interesting times quicker than the HC 2003, so he was in a good position to win the race, but at a certain point he goes in front of the boxes with the engines off, so one of the two engines had lubrication problems, it was melted and Uvalari had to withdraw. Vittorio Iano decides at that moment to change the teams, the crew members. So he asks Giuseppe Campari to stop with the 8 c 2003 and to uh, have Tazio Nuvolari drive that car. So at the time, the rules allowed it, Tazio Nuvolari jumps on the 8 c 2003 maintains a good position of Campari and improves it. And in the end, he would win the uh, Grand Prix of Italy in 1951 with 8-3-2003 racing car which would be called 8C2003 Monza, and that we have here at the museum in front of the Type A. Vittorio Iano, getting back to the Portello, ponders on what happened and starts to uh, change and modify the Type A to uh, solve the problem. But what Vittorio Iano didn't consider was that they could have lubrication problems with the uh, system of the 1750, which won't uh, important races, but not even the Mille Miglia had such strong lateral accelerations that created problems to the 
uh, oil pump causing a problem of lubrication, Vittoriano modifies immediately this detail and creates a, a dry carter lubrication with the recuperation pump which accumulates the oil, obtaining advantages also in terms of cooling in two tanks placed at the sides of the seat. The type A modified in this way and with other details then competes in other races. The most curious one for certain aspects would be the Susa Moncenisio in 1931. The Susa Moncenisio is an historical race. Let's say that Alfa Romeo never uh, focused on that uh, race so much, but Giuseppe Campari did. Uh, in 1925, in that race, he not only won with the P2, but he also marked the best time. It, that race is characterized by a stairs, so a series of uh, very narrow curves in a very narrow street in the mountain. So it's not an ideal environment for such a powerful car, but it, even uh, with these conditions, Vittorio Giano asks to participate to the Susa Moncenisio to defend his record during the tests he was the favorite one and it breaks all the records so apparently there were no rivals no competitors thanks to a detail during the test giuseppe campari who uh, used all the power in the short uh, straight lines arrived at this curbs and switched off one of the two engines in order to attack the curb only with the outer uh, engine on and the outer wheel on and then relight the engine on the short straight stretch and then he switched the other engine attacking the other curb so with this method it could be more aggressive but the problem was that if during the test everything went good and the time was excellent during the race, during one of these operations, something didn't work and during uh, uh, one of the curbs, the other, the, the running engine <laughs> shut down as well. So uh, the pilot had to jump out, push the car, the car was clogged, it had two engines and when he starts to, uh, it manages to restart it just ranked fifth, uh, so when it comes back at the Alpha, uh, there was embarrassment, there was the press there, and Canestrini, the greatest automobile journalist in Italy in those days, starts to follow Campari and Iano, asking them what happened to the car. And they both agree in saying that there were uh, problems at the candles, hiding that operation that they didn't want to disclose and communicate to the press. The Susa Moncenisio was a great disappointment for Campari, but as we see, after some time he would have the possibility of uh, uh, winning and the Type A obtained its only win. The Type A was planned for fast uh, uh, circuits and if Monza uh, and the Susa Moncenisio could not be favorite. In, uh, on the 15th of August 1931, the Coppa Cervo was uh, established in Pescara. The circuit was on the streets, but the composition was very strange. It's like a triangle where you have two very long straight lines where the cars can run fast and then a mixed stretch. The type A is a very fast on the straight line because it's very powerful, but it also showed to be very drivable in the mixed terrain. So Pescara seems to be the great occasion. On that occasion as well, Giuseppe Campari and Tazio Nuvolari drive the 12 cylinders and Tazio Nuvolari, who with this car uh, was unfortunate, had a problem at the joint of the head and had to withdraw. Campari, on the contrary, would win that race, giving the Alfa Romeo on the 12 cylinder its first win. There was enthusiasm at the time. It was underlined how Alfa Romeo had a tool able to uh, beat 
the best in every circuit, but if it's Arroyano, already thinking about something else. For the type A, he developed a new uh, chassis, uh, he uh, changed the brakes, he fine-tuned all the parts of the single-seater, and he already was thinking about the real uh, master of ours, the Grand Premio Type B, who would debut in Monza in 1932 and would uh, mark uh, a an era of uh, successes. But for the Type A, the career was not over. After the win of Pescara, there was another appointment, the Grand Prix of Monza. It was not the Grand Prix of Italy in Monza, held in May, but it was the, the Grand Prix uh, which was run in the Autodrome uh, in September. So the Type 8 started to have problems, uh, would not give the best and could not win the GAR. When they ended at, uh, in that race, uh, many there was an accident and many people of the audience died. So the Type A was abandoned without regret, not because there, it was not promising, but because the future was for the Type B, the one that the press nicknamed P3, following the P2. Uh, legend uh, conquering the uh, world championship in 1925. So what happened in the four complete cars which were uh, built uh, was what happened to the competition sports cars. They were cannibalized, disassembled, demolished because the races always look ahead. So if we have a leap uh, forward, we go to the 60s. When the museum starts to take shape, Luigi Fusi starts to look at what they have inside, at, at, uh, in house at the Portello, he begins to buy, to exchange, to look for and restore cars and put together what is still today the heart of the collection of the museum of Alfa Romeo. And together with Giuseppe Loraghi, who wanted the museum and supported it, but they start to think how there is no example of two engine cars. So there were Type B, and then in 1935, done at the Scuderia Ferrari, there were two models in Alfa, but both were not present at the museum. So uh, finally, Vittorio Iano, no, sorry, I apologize, Luigi Fusi, with the uh, support of Giuseppe Loraghi, obtains the authorization to rebuild this car and to create a didactic reconstruction. So an exemplary of car that could uh, show the records broken by that car, which was no longer available. Luigi Fusi knew very well the Type A because Luigi Fusi at the time of Yano was one of the designers. He worked on this project. Many drawings had his signature and as an enthusiast, he followed the story and its details. And when he was charged with the rebuilding of this car uh, at his department, so mechanics, technicians and great enthusiasts, uh, which were restoring the cars of the museum. But he accepted this adventure with enthusiasm. So he starts to find all the available parts many taken from other cars, and he starts to understand how he could rebuild certain missing parts so the car would not be a running car, just a static example. So some components were obtained by simplifying, for example, two shafts which are not cylinders but are, have a cone shape on real running cars were obtained by melting the metal on the replica of the Type A, these were obtained by putting together uh, tubes of different diameter. Other components were taken, for example, the uh, uh, front part from the HC 2003 uh, was uh, found, and the box, one of the uh, driving boxes of the Type A, which was behind the dashboard, was found at the Portello, it was on a shelf. But what is the main problem is finding the two engines that had to be modified. Luigi Fusi tells all these details of the reconstruction 
together with the history of the car, in a book published by Alfa Romeo, which was published because the uh, Type A uh, reconstruction not only was a great adventure, but it was also the first real uh, gesture uh, aiming at a museum. So not only the, uh, something done by a company which collects elements of its history, but a company that wants to tell this history to the audience. So that team was very peculiar. There were incredible characters which had very fine hands, even though sometimes they, these hands were strong and big. But this team was a team of people working to uh, express the value of a brand which was like their family. But some parts of this adventure and also the origins of some of these components should be narrated by someone who lived that epoch. So one of the guests of today is Stefano D'Amico, who for more than 30 years was the president of uh, the Italian register of Alfa Romeo. He transformed it into a real reference point for the owners of historical Alfa Romeo. He's a great uh, expert of Alfa Romeo, but above all a person who in this world knew everyone and is known by everyone. And among them, Luigi Fusi as well. I met Luigi Fusi in the 70s, uh, in the beginning of the 70s. It was a very peculiar person working at the Portello. Uh, Arese was under contraction. The new uh, plants were just finished, but certain offices, in particular the hangars at the back of the plant, uh, well, was still full of incredible pieces and Fuzzy was working there. These pieces today uh, would be uh, loved by collectors. There were uh, chassis, uh, body works, uh, and in a corner there were tables on which an Alfa Romeo, which apparently looked like a 1750, was taking shape and two RL, one by Count Lorani and the other one, uh, owned by the museum next to Luigi Fusi, uh, there were incredible workers. Uh, I still remember the faces and perfectly. But unfortunately, they are not remembered by history, but they are those who, directed by Fusi, uh, gave shape to the uh, cars of the museum. The Type A was done by incredible workers. One in particular was called Taglia Bue, who funnily was very thin and short, was probably 30 kilograms. And I don't know how he could uh, use the hammers and give shape to those uh, plates of metal. And so Ferrari said that those by Alpha could create glass for flies. They were incredible people. Canzi, Paggetti. Paggetti had very thin moustache. Del Monte. They are all the collaborators uh, who worked hand in hand with Fusi, who also worked with incredible engine workers. Morlacchi, very tall, with huge hands, always working with compressors or carburetors. And that Sala, the mythical Giulio Sala, nicknamed Saletta because he was probably 1 meter 50, was very short and he was the mechanic of Fangio. And he was incredibly good at fine tuning the cars, in particular the 159. I've always seen him work on the 159. And Fuzzi gather the pieces to rebuild the Type A almost everywhere in Italy, supported by a great English uh, collector, Angela Cerret, and another Italian collector, Mario Righini, in Modena. So he was able to rebuild through them the entire car. So one engine was not complete, the other one was complete but old, 
and in researching the pieces, in specifically the type A, he was helped by Augusto Zanardi, another mythical name of Alfa Romeo. He was also a mechanic and he worked with Fangio and many others. He is a man who lived the history of Alfa Romeo and the building of the Museum of Alfa Romeo. Well, I'm happy to hear that Lorenzo Ardizio dedicated some time to think about these people because I think that these names uh, are not remembered by no one. No one ever remembered them. We know everything about the cars of the museum. We know a lot of how they were done, but the people who created them, where many pieces were found, well, it was only Fuzi who knew this. Uh, Fuzi wrote this on certain folders, uh, which were his personal Bible, where he also put all the invoices, the people where he bought the pieces, the uh, uh, letters with other collectors in the world, where the pieces were exchanged. I give you this piece, you give me that piece. So you saw where the pieces came from, how Luigi Fuzi was working for the reconstruction of these cars. Uh, yes, and then I also had as a little role in the reconstruction of the Type A indirectly. At the time, I was working at ENI, and I was very young and probably very silly, so I, I, they sent me to the most difficult countries, among which Libya. In Libya, Muammar Gaddafi uh, just arrived at the power uh, after the king uh, Idris accusing him to be too uh, pro-Western uh, cultures and not Islam culture. So the first thing which he did was sending home all the Italians who arrived just in a moment when all the Italians were pushed away from uh, Libya. I went to Tripoli and one of the first things I did was going to the bishop of Tripoli, a very a tall Italian uh, called Fran Michele. He was uh, very young, I don't know, maybe he's still alive. He was a Franciscan priest and his uh, church was transformed into a mosque and was like a small Santa Maria Novella. But the nice thing was that below the church he had a huge garage where many of the poor Italians were to flee, left many things, many objects, uh, uh, pictures, uh, uh, furniture, uh, there were a Moto Guzzi, one Vespa, one Fiat 600, one Appia, one Giulia, and in a corner there was a huge case with Alfa Romeo. So I, I immediately was drawn by this uh, wooden case with a brand Alfa Romeo. And he said there was a brand new engine of 1,750 Alfa Romeo. So you can imagine the, 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 the joy, the enthusiasm, how incredulous I was finding, finding this below a church among other things. So the first thought was, how can I uh, take this with me? How can I take this with me? So the thing arrived thanks to Imsai Dubar. This person was the assistant of Jean Lud, who was the number two of Libya, the number two of Gaddafi, friend of Italy. Well, even Gaddafi was a friend of Italy. Apparently, he uh, uh, wanted to do the opposite, but he was a friend. And we managed with a lot of lies, uh, confusion, and brilliant ideas to have this engine be transformed in, in a pump. So we, we said it was a pump for oil pits. So we brought it to Italy in, in the name of Eni. So as a replacement uh, piece for Ajip drilling pits. So it arrived in Milan and it was left at the testing room where Mr. Garbarino, engineer Garbarino from Auto Delta, had steady relationships. Well, Lorenzo, I like to tell you these stories. I like you to take note of this because at least I have the satisfaction of handing down these stories to someone. So 
in the testing room of Ajip in San Donato, the fuels were tested. So specific mixes in particular, very smelly, in others, uh, exploding mixtures. And there was a direct collaboration with Autodelta through engineer Garbarino. There were several GT8 engines, with, uh, several heads, solutions were tried and many fuels were tried with high octanes to have a greater performance on competition engines. So this engine arrived there, it was replaced by, the, by an old broken GTA engine taken from there from the Autodelta. So it was taken. There was an exchange. So this engine coming from Libya was brought to the museum. The president of Alpha was Mr. Cortesi, if I'm not wrong, in that period. Massacesi was not there yet. Uh, I, I believe it was Cortesi. Well, the museum didn't exist yet, but it went to the Portello in the hands of Fusi, who put it on the Type A. So the satisfaction was great. Uh, everyone thanked me and Alfa Romeo acknowledged me and he, they also gave me a silver box, but a small tea box in silver as a wedding present and a painting, well, a, 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 a lithograph by Burri, which I still have with a dedication. And, and the engine, I don't know where the engine went in a historical Mille Miglia, 1750 was broken and this engine which was a perfectly a brand new engine never used before never opened before was mounted on a car I don't know what was put on the type A or what is there today but apart from these episodes it is fascinating to remind the joy the expression of Fusi telling how Nuvolari was driving this car. I don't know whether it was uh, true or not because he was telling that in such an incredible way. I don't even know if he ever saw that or was there looking at the test. But it was nice to hear and for a young person, a young fan, listening from the words of this man who was still walking on, on his legs and then, as we know, he had to go on a wheelchair later on. But he knew every single nut or screw. It was uh, a didactic replica, as Tito Anselmi called them. These were reconstructions to show how that car uh, was, as the two RL are also didactic replicas, those cars that are in the museum, while well, reconstruction, which is a, a good and running one, was the RL by Gon Count Lurani, an American uh, collector, an RL Targa Florio, which was done with uh, several original pieces, all found by Fusi, partly in England through Cherwet and partly by Regini, who was a, a gold mine for all the fans. Well, this is the historical part of the men who built the Type A. But as a first reconstruction, Alfa Romeo, Fusi, Luraghi choose an incredible car with an incredible history. You are very good at describing the car in its technical aspects. The car was not a lucky car, if I'm not wrong. Arcangeli also died with that car. 
Uh, am I correct? Well, it was not a car giving incredible satisfactions to Alfa Romeo. I think that only Nuvolari could drive it with its spectacular way of driving, even though because it blocked one engine on the curb, giving full power to the other engine. And then he opened again the other engine. It was a spectacular way of driving. I think that the Type A only had three uh, gears. So he, he, you can imagine the synchronization of the levers, the gear, the transmission, the engines. I, I don't know. I don't know how I could. It's good that it is in a museum as the other mythical Alfa Romeo two engines with 16 cylinders, eight in the front, eight in the back, other incredible reconstruction by Luigi Fusi. Talking about the history of the museum, we often talk about the team of Luigi Fusi, so-called Repartino. We have the drawings that Fusi uh, did for the museum, we have letters and documents, and in the collection we also have many tools and objects which were used to restore and rebuild the cars. Uh, this wooden piece, for example, was used by the workers which modeled the front part of the Type A. But this repartino, this, this department, how was it? Well, what was fascinating was that I can say I was there. So. I saw this department at the Portello, I think its name was Via della Fonderia, it was near the design center, the Centro Stile, there was a, a street, the foundries were to the left, at the, at the end there was a hangar, which was a room for testing uh, engines, probably in the past, but uh, Fusi found room there to start the reconstruction work and restoration work of many cars, which then became those incredible pieces now kept in Arese. But everything was born at the Portello by the will of Luraghi, which I remember very well because Camillo Marchetti introduced him to me. And I also remember very well the feelings they had at such a young enthusiast like me, a young dreamer like me, could go in offices and spaces walking on floors which in the past were walked, touched and seen by characters like Nuvolari, the great drivers, Fangio himself, and Fusi, Fusi, Fusi himself. He was so sweet, as everyone in Alfa was. Very few were not sweet. Well, Guido Moroni was a peculiar character, one of the test pilots of Alfa, but the others were all splendid, very sweet. Each one, of course, had his character, but in particular, the team of the great pilot testers, the test pilots, were incredible characters with an incredible experience, but also full of human uh, feelings. Well, uh, huge enterprises in the end are made by the people. Yes, the names, I like to recall those names. As I said, the memory is present. I see them in their uh, light blue overalls. I see the one with the hammer, Zanardi, always working uh, with the engine of an eight-cylinder. <laughs> Characters who no longer exist. And I'm incredibly happy to having met them, uh, shaken a hand, uh, knowing Fusi, Gian Balsanesi, Bonini, going to uh, uh, their homes. Uh, actually, his wife was incredible at cooking. Uh, in the case of Bonini, listening to their stories, the story of uh, Pietro, his father, and having dinner with them. 
But please do not forget these names. Because these names are those who built almost all the cars of the museum. Especially the reconstructions, like the white one, the Grimol. I, I, I recall them in this hunger. And there were many, there were many men of Fuzi working on these cars. And then little by little, financial problems, budgets arrived. The Fuzi was always looking for budgets. It was very uh, good with Camillo Marchetti, who was responsible for exterior relationships and was also responsible with the museum. I don't know how he could find the money because those moments for Alfa Romeo were very hard and difficult in order to find money to uh, restore the cars and also to find the pieces. But uh, he was supported by characters like Regini in Rome. There were the Venturi brothers, one of them committed suicide. They had incredible cars, which in the years of the post-war, Alfa Romeo tried to sell many of their race cars and Venturi and other great dealers bought them. And in the end, they had to resell them because they also had problems. But Venturi contributed a lot to give spare parts. Baron Franchetti, always in Rome, Giorgio Franchetti, gave to uh, the Cecchignola Milton Museum a 1,750 Alfa Romeo, an S, S, I think, the small compressor uh, with the uh, pointed Tail, uh, different engines, also Franchetti gave a lot of material free of charge to Fusi for the museum. And Fusi collecting these pieces was incredible. Well, I thank you for your contribution, which not only gives us uh, incredible anecdotes, but also lets us relieve the atmosphere of this area, this area, because today the museum lives out of the passion and work of those people. Thanks again. Luigi Fusi documents all the steps in the letters and also in the book so of the reconstruction of type A, which when presented was the pride of the team, the Repartino and the museum. But it was not the only reconstruction. Also the RL, the 40, 60 HP and others were reconstructed. Some models which were lost in years, and the other two engines were also reconstructed. The one with eight cylinders in the front and eight in the back from 1935 with its incredible power of 540 horsepower. But the second life of the Type A also tells an important aspect of the museum, which has to be alive. The museum, which was considered after many years a place where objects are simply showcased, also has the need of telling the story of the object, telling the story of values and conveying values. So it's incredible in a, an era when the collectors were at the beginning, the Alfa Romeo already had its vision and uh, charged its curator to rebuild what was no longer possible to have in its original form. These are not replicas, it's not the attempt of covering gaps, but it was the attempt to tell stories and make them understandable also to those who could not imagine them by looking at drawings or reading books. So the didactic reconstructions are one of the pillars of the Alfa Romeo Museum, which has several of them, but today they are also vintage cars, even though they are reconstructions. But in order to better know the world of didactic reconstructions and their importance, giving value to a museum and interacting with the audience, we wanted to invite a guest, another person who can tell us some anecdotes of another incredible and magical place. So, we went to Milan in one of the most beautiful museums 
the Museum of Science and Technology Leonardo da Vinci in Milan, a few kilometers from Arese. And Fiorenzo Galli is the director of the museum uh, here with us. He will tell us uh, something about the didactic reconstructions and how the way of showcasing objects and telling stories can also go through not real objects, but through reconstructions. The Museum of Science and Technology has many original objects, but also many replicas. What is the meaning of these? First of all, thank you, thank you, and welcome. The meaning is apparent. So, as you have said, we have many, many original pieces, also big size and spectacular pieces, those that we call highlights, but of course we are obliged, just to give you an answer, when these original pieces are not available, but we have to witness with our activity a series of uh, historical and functional realities which need to be told to an audience which is not necessarily and completely uh, at ease at uh, reading uh, drawings, just like architects or engineers, the general public needs to have something physical. For example, we have an incredible model of 1956 here, which is an interpretative model of a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. Here we are in the Leonardo da Vinci galleries of the Museum of Science and Technology. 1,300 square meters dedicated to Leonardo, over the years, starting from 1953, when this museum was born, we started to collect important pieces. We have the uh, greatest and more uh, complete range of models built, like this one, in different sizes, which interpret the drawings of Leonardo. There is nothing <laughs> existing of what Leonardo thought, but he left incredible drawings and he also uh, gave us the interesting ideas. This, which is sort of a cart, was a stage machine, but it has characteristics that recall a car or, or a truck, you know, because it's mobile. It's, it's difficult to understand that by looking at the drawing, but here you see in the model that the differential was born here because the uh, wheels can be moved independently but so we have no original tools but we can tell these histories of uh, intelligence and wit with these reconstructions in our museum the collection was put together uh, towards the end of the 50s the beginning of the 60s and in 1976 when they, uh, it was open, and that's when the didactic reconstructions were done, just like the Type A we're talking about today. But in the meantime, the collector's world and the automobile world and museum world, ch world changed. Today, also industrial products are considered work of art by the audience at the museum. So the role of reconstructions in this field has it changed or still today we continue to reconstruct and rebuild to explain? But what I said before is valid again. So when you have, if they exist and you can buy or obtain the original ones, it's great. They are taken and shown to the public just like all the other Italian museums you have many more deposits in the warehouses than those that we can showcase. So thanks to the technology you mentioned before, we can, through the digital, showing uh, exploded drawings or moving 3D drawings, so we can show things that maybe in that moment, in that stage, for an exhibition or a certain reason, uh, cannot be shown on or showcased here. But just to make an example, we have an incredible drawing by Leonardo, a series of drawings by Leonardo, of a lever winch, which was born when well, Leonardo was young before coming to Milan when he was still in Florence, uh, coming from his little village Vinci with his father, was uh, uh, put to the test at the Verrocchio craft shop. He looked around Florence, Florence was uh, a thriving architectural city, so the 
dome a roof was being built, uh, then done by Brunelleschi. So there a, was a copper sphere and cross. It was done at the Verrocchio, a shop. So there was no uh, sealing machines at the time, so they were extremely weak. And Leonardo used the drawing as a study method. So not everything that he uh, drew was an invention, but it was probably a reproduction, an interpretation of what he saw. He was very good and he used the drawings in this way. So the drawing of the lever winch is extraordinary. It could have been done with a CAD computer by an engineer. And another drawing of this type, but completely different because it was just a few centimeters a sketch, 9, 10 centimeters sketch, is the design linked to a an element that could reproduce something produced, a canvas produced by one craftsman anticipating by 300 years the industrial revolution of the textile. So here we have the physical element, the machine, which makes you understand better than an idea. But around this, several people could work. And one of the ideas of Leonardo was taking away the physical work from people. It was incredibly generous. So I didn't want people to feel fatigued. So uh, looking at these models with uh, heavy weights uh, and in a way, this triggered in him the ideas. Okay, so just to talk about transports. So over the years, there was a nice collaboration between our museums. Some cars and engines were also given here and one was also given back because it is temporarily showcased at our museum, the 512 without the bodywork, which also shows what's below the skin of a car. But talking about automobiles or transports in general, well, it's changing in terms of approaching technologies. And it is more and more difficult or challenging talking to young people. So, what messages can you convey to the audience of schools that come frequently here to this museum? Well, as our founder uh, defined it, this is the museum of how the world is evolving. So it has to tell this evolution. So in 1958, it uh, devised this definition. So you can imagine today how the progress is continuous. And we start this by not only showcasing objects that also in the era of mobility are extremely fascinated. It's fascinating, but if we talk about the cars, we have the uh, Totti submersible. We have the maquette of the Vega, which is a reproduction, but uh, on a one-to-one -one, uh, scale uh, of the Vega rocket. Uh, produced by the European Space Agency, but of Italian design, which was used to launch the uh, um, satellites of the Copernico project, observing the Earth from the space, so monitoring, for example, the environmental situation of uh, the world. As we have planes, uh, boats, uh, trains, everything. But apart from these historical objects, which are beautiful to admire, and in the case, uh, you can even go on them because they're a big size. We can, and we should look at the future. Uh, we should look at what will be the future of Romeo in the future. We'll also deal with that and we will see the results. So with the GRC, which is the uh, Joint Research Center of the European Union, which is based close to us in ISPRA, uh, we have organized a project on uh, artificial intelligence and I hope it will replace the natural stupidity we are surrounded by, among other things. It offers the possibility of traveling 
with an Oculus, a, a next gen Oculus on a self driving car with all the feelings connected by uh, transforming it in a service where you are home, you want to go and see a museum, for example, your museum. So from your home, you book it. Uh, there's no one driving this car, it comes to your place, etc. This is already possible, but a series of uh, situations that you already know have to be fine tuned. But we have to look at this. But we cannot present something which is not there yet, but we can present it in a didactic, uh, in a pleasant way. So, something through a didactic tool, a reconstruction, be it a reconstruction of the past or the future. The aim is give an understanding to those who go in the museums and which represents a goal, so representing at its best what can be appealing to the audience. So I accept the invitation to discover some of these models and we will show something to our audience as well. Coming to this museum is always an incredible experience which every time is new and I suggest if you have not done it to come here to absorb this creativity and this genius which is present in every corner but I thank you uh, Mr. Director for your welcoming. I thank you and some of our visitors uh, who has not visited the Alfa Romeo Museum yet I invite them to come to your museum because it's very fascinating for everyone not only automobile fans. Thanks again. For some more details on these objects and on the other objects linked to Alfa Romeo present at the uh, Museum of Science and Technology, I would like to thank also Marco Yezzi, the curator of the transport department of this museum. So we are in one of the uh, most loved pavilions of uh, the Museum of uh, Science, Art and Technology, the railroad pavilion, which not only hosts trains, but tells somehow the entire system of rail uh, of road transportation in the past. So the real revolution was the introduction of the engine in the different transportation means. And the museum is rich in engine transportation means. Even our Scuola Ebe sailing boat has in its belly an engine used for the small maneuvers, even though it, it is a sailing boat. Next to it, there's a very fascinating object, which is an airboat, which in the 30s was used for races on the Pavia Venezia stretch along the Po River. And our airboat was built partly by Sia Marchetti, like the wheel, etc. And then in the upper part, the Alfa Romeo engine. And now I would like to show you something below the airboat because there's a magical place from my point of view. I'm the curator of the museum that is a magical area. It is the warehouse of the museum. It is not the only warehouse of the museum. It is the space where we keep the uh, average or small objects that finally after years of work we were able to open to the audience through guides and guided tours. So we have a collection of bicycles and motorbikes and much, many, many, much more things like cameras and also devices which uh, won Nobel Prizes. Uh, we have motorcycles, like two incredible objects, the Vesca, Vespa and the Lambretta. In our collection we can see important motorbikes. For example, a Bianchi owned by Tazio Nuvolari. Tazio Nuvolari, great pilot uh, who won everything with automobiles, also raced with the motorbikes and planes. And this by Bianchi is an example. The objects of the museum are more than 20,000 
and they tell the story of the automobile industry, of the industry of transports, and uh, the history of all the production which characterize our country. So we are waiting for you here. We are open whenever you want, and also the warehouses are open. Today we discovered the legendary history of an incredible object which helped to draw the legend of the brand. We've seen something technical, we've seen the sports adventures, we've also seen how it was hybridized with the history of clocks and time and uh, we saw when Alpha decided to make its collection a real museum in the modern meaning of the term. It's an history that, like many others of this museum, was narrated in this episode of the Backstage. I also invite you to look at the agenda, 2022 agenda of the Backstages, where we will talk about many histories known or hidden of the Alfa Romeo legend. We will talk about the Alfetta next month. Well, not a general Alfetta, we will talk about the general model in June, but we'll talk about the Alfetta, which raised the Cape North, Cape South raid. So when a series car crossed two continents without ever leaving the food from the accelerator to the Arctic ice, to the jungle, to the uh, sand dunes, a great adventure that deserves an episode. So, I would like to thank Stefano D'Amico, Fiorenzo Galli, Marco Iezzi, who were our guests today, and uh, I hope to see you next month. Thank you, have a nice day.